Stand up here, oh, stand up here, stand up here, until the war is ended. The GT programs for this year. I'm Harry DeMarm, the Director of Education. I uh, want to thank a few of the people who make this possible before we hear from tonight's speaker. Uh, I want to thank the City of Savannah, as always, for, uh, for providing investment in the programs that we offer for the public as well as the Georgia Council for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. I hope some of you were here Saturday. I know some of you were here Saturday for our kickoff event, uh, the Juneteenth Family Day here at the Jepson Center. Tonight we have a real treat with uh, Queen Quet coming back to do something a little different for us this year, uh, a lecture um, which I think is going to be really amazing. And to introduce our speaker, I have to introduce the architect of Juneteenth um, at Telford Museums, Juana Good Walker, who is also currently the director of the Ralph Mark Gilbert Civil Rights Museum. Juana Good Walker um, started our Juneteenth program here in 2007, originally at the Owens Thomas House and Slave Quarters site, and then moved here to the Jepson Center. And since then, we've had um, our celebration, our family days, as well as lectures um, almost every year during that 16-year um, period since. So, I'd like to thank Vonette for all the work that she puts into this each year and invite her to the stage. And I know she'll be introducing Dr. Jamal Ture, who is going to be joining us again today and has always been part of our Juneteenth celebration. So please welcome Vonette Good Walker. Oh, freedom. Oh. I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, can't you just hear him say it about freedom? No more moaning, please God. No more moaning, let me no more moaning over me. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Welcome to the Juneteenth Sweet Sixteen. Yes. Sixteen years of Juneteenth on the stage here at the Jepson, starting out over at the Owens Thomas House. We freed them over there, and we freed you over here. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. Now, Y'all know I was singing like I was in church. Mm -hmm. So y'all gonna have to come down so y'all, I can see y'all. I can't see nobody up there in the rafters. Come on down, let's get closer. We don't have to be a part anymore. All right, come on down. This is gonna be good. This is gonna be good. This is a reunion with my sister and Queen Quet, the great Queen Quet, Dr. Jamal Ture. We had the showers here. Y'all miss the showers? Oh, yeah. Oh, he missed the showers. That was the one I'm here for, too. Absolutely. That was amazing. Yes. But this is a special year because the issue of land is very important in our community. I live on my ancestral land. I live in the house I grew up, grew up in. I live everywhere my ancestors provided for me. And that is why this year's theme is so important to all of you. Because we need to impress upon our community, we need to impress upon our families, the need to save this land and keep it in our families. This land lost shit. 40 acres and a mule, that's not a spike meat production. Thank you. That's something that really happened. Yes. And what happened, a statement of its overall importance, is what I want to share with you as I begin to introduce our guests. Nothing captured the minds of newly freed Africans like the promise of 40 acres and a mule. Definition to this elusive dream was given in the city of Savannah, January 12, 1865. Look at the importance of where you are. Please understand, it was here. You are here. Yes. Now, the other part of this, it was in the meeting at the Green Mansion that took place with Major General William Sherman, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, and 20 African church leaders. 
And again on January 16, 1865 at the Second Baptist Church when Major General Sherman issued Special Field Order Number 15. These events have been immortalized in literature and the arts. But here in Savannah, when are we going to honor it? When are we going to understand what it really meant? With all the messages that we give to people, we're not giving them this message. That's right. Because I want to tell you, Savannah, when I walk around this urban setting, we were a marble cake in this Oglethorpe plan. Black community, white community, black community, white community. That was the marble cake. Mm -hmm. Is it that way now? No, not at all. Was it that way in the 70s? Yes. yes. In the 80s? Yes. yes. In the 90s? No. And moving forward. I live in the historic Calabronville. That's where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Didn't know it was historic. I just knew it was the edge of town, kind of sort of. Mm -hmm. But now I understand. I live in Montgomery, the Gullah Geechee community no, I don't live in yes. Pinpoint. Come on right. now. No, I don't live in Sandfly. I live yes. at Montgomery, Speak next right. door to the Montgomery Baptist Church. That was a Freeman school that was pulled from the Bewley Plantation, next door to the land my grandfather was by the year I was born. Mm -hmm. So that's why land is important to me. And if you're going to sell your land, mm. if you look like me, sell it to somebody who look looks like you. Like you. Right. Right. That's all I'm going to say about that. Now I'm getting, I'm getting wound up here, but it's not my job, it's not my job. And y'all know I don't need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on down, we in church. We come in peace, peace of land. Come on. That's right. All right. And the next person, though, I'm going to introduce is my colleague here for the Sweet 16 Juneteenth mm -hmm. celebration. I don't know what we're going to do next year, because I'm going to top this, is Jamal Ture. And Jamal Ture has been with us as the African spirit. Mm -hmm. He's brought us so many interesting subjects. I'm surprised he's not wearing a t-shirt tonight that says Save the Land. I know. I got it tonight. You got it? You got it? You got your own? Okay, all right. I had mine, but it didn't match my outfit tonight. I got it. All right. But, but I want to thank you all for coming, and we want to get this program going. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Noe, Jennifer Noe Queen. Mm -hmm. Do you want to know about us? Do you want to know about our queen? Mm -hmm. It is Paula Wanda. Mm -hmm. It is St. Helena. Mm -hmm. It is Frog Moth. Mm -hmm. It is someone who is a scientist, a computer scientist and a mathematician. Someone from the soil of St. Helena. And some of y'all know it over here is Frog Moth. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all know it is Paula Wanda. Some of y'all know it is Dalta. Some of y'all know it's Cat. Some of y'all know it's ladies out of Buford County, the northern part of the Broad Road. Her people have been there since the very beginning. Her people going back to the time that when we look at one of the first concentration camps that we call uh, reservations for Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Queen Quet, our chiefess of the Gullah Geechee Nation. And some go and ask the question, how did she become queen? Because it was a vote amongst Gullah Geechee people in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. We said that we had a body. We had a body from North Carolina down to Florida. We had a body, but we needed a head on the body. Mm -hmm. So then a vote was made with regards to someone who's been active with regards to an organization called ACON, the African Cultural Arts Network. Mm -hmm. Someone who created the first online Gullah Geechee organization, the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition. Mm -hmm. And so she brought people from, North, was from New York, from the Northeast down here to now understand what the culture and history is about. The person who's going before the United Nations, and when she cracked her teeth like this year, that people began to scramble because the transmitters were not, the translators were, could not understand. They it was the first time that they ever heard Gullah being spoken. Mm -hmm. And from there, they then said that yes, the Gullah Kitchen people are a linguistic minority in the United States. And a tribute tied to Dr. Yusuf Incline, who understood the importance of this woman who was called Queen Quet, that when the people voted for her to become the mother hen of the Gullah Kitchen Nation, Gullah Kitchen people. You want to know about us? You got to know her. Mm -hmm. An activist, an artist, an artist, someone who's out there putting it out there, working harder than anyone else. No one in Savannah, 
No one in Georgia, no one in Florida, no one in South Carolina, no one in North Carolina, or anyone in Nassau, Mental to Los Negros, or over in Oklahoma that said that they work as hard for Gullah people. She's my sister. We've been on this road for so long, we go back in time talking about some over some 20 years about saving land, saving black land, educating people about that, and having workshops and having meetings that sometimes only three people are here. Only three people came. Yes, she is here tonight. Our queen. Yet are we. Here we stand. Our queen. Queen Quest. A round of applause for our queen, the leader of the Gullah Geechee Nation. Artist, activist, author, historian, and the mother hen of all of we. Queen Quest. Thank you. Cross the bridge and thing, and land their way for crack with tea. 
And we start speaking the way they spoke. We said, well, now we should get understanding. Because wisdom is the principal thing. And in all thy gain, you're to get understanding. That's scripture. The same book that some say, well, as the white man handed that book to us, they were actually using the other hand to take your land. And I said, well, that's an interesting statement the first time I heard it. I said, because the land where I stand, we have both the Bible as one book, and we sure enough had the pocketbook. Because the ancestors took them both, and that's how they knew that after all that shit, all that shit, all that coming together and staying in the fear, the spirit and spiritual rules are being on. And when they go ahead and their things say, go on you on to the auction. They said, but that's a great God, we want the auction again. And then it's your own one. Shout for the Lamb knows it. The end of that kind of auction. And then the end of that day. And say, no, see, and then walk around now. Then they are. So all of what they have, that thing is going on for sale. Not all. My ancestors went, raised their hands. Bid on the very same pieces of property that they used to be listed besides on people's wills. Because they too were chattel that could be bought, could be sold, could be bartered, could be traded, could be given as a gift. So when I thought about it, I said, well, then why doesn't America see Gullah Geechee people as gifts now? Because we have always been a gift. There would be no United States without the Gullah Geechee people. Ibo, Madinka, Malinke, Yuriba, Gola, Gizi, Mendi, Temni, Fiki, Vivio, join with the Yamasi, the Kusambo, the Cree, the Adisto, and they carved out a cultural heritage landscape from Jacksonville, North Carolina, to Jacksonville, North Carolina, on what are called the Sea Island. And then as they started crossing over them, cricket and things like that, they ended up 35 miles inland to the St. John's River. All of this, people wrote of in the 1800s and said, wow, to a nation within a nation. And the people who were doing the writing were not of African descent. They were not of indigenous American descent. And the reason they wrote it was because they were so stunned in the disbelief that they could come to a land and find all these Negro people, black people, people of African descent everywhere. As Peter Wood said, we were the black majority on that coast. Until, huh, Somebody decided to go off in the wilderness and not for the reasons that my ancestors did. They didn't go there seeking. They didn't go there praying, be born in the wilderness. They went out in the wilderness hunting. And after they finished killing stuff, bloodletting on the ground, they would sit around fires and they would cook this meat. And then they said, well, hmm, this is interesting. They start bringing their friends down from up north to do this with them. And then they start killing birds. They start killing deer. They start killing wild boars. They start killing the corn and everything like that. And when we use a damn bun, so good and thing like that. I told those women, they had a thing about that. Now they tell you, throw you in jail if you do them. So now, the friends start looking around and saying, who is Beautiful place. I don't always want to hunt. Why don't we go fishing? But they didn't know how to navigate the waters. So what did they do? Come down the road a little bit. Find some of them funny talking black folk. I said, we'll pay you if you teach us how to go out in the waterways. Can you be our oarsman? And here our ancestors started making some more money to buy some more land by actually going out and taking these people from these hunting lodges and these fishing camps out on these journeys into the wilderness. But it wasn't like 
what would happen when we went seeking in the wilderness when you come out saying, How do we feel when you come? Come out in the wilderness. Come out.
If your ego say, don't let them know you don't know, you go ahead and sign whether it's an X or your full name, and guess what you've now given away your whole legacy? For a couch, for a set, for a car, because now maybe some of y'all give it away for a cell phone. Because somebody said that's the latest thing that you must have. So what they told us we must have is that we must have an education according to European standards. We must have a behavior that mimicked what Anglo people did, that we must not be too African. And part of being African and holding on to our Africanisms was holding on to the land and living on it communally. So we hadn't seen those papers because we never had those papers until somebody went to the auction. Once somebody held on to that paper that was that deed that said, in 1862, this person got this property, X amount of acres, bounded by the creek on one side, bounded by so-and-so on the other side, bounded by this dirt road in the other part, and they have X amount of acres, and it belongs to them and their heirs. Well, from 1862 to now, many of us are now the heirs of that property and the heirs of cultural heritage legacy, but we are also the heirs of assimilation. So you have now an issue about black land ownership in the Bible Belt South, and in particular, the Gullah Geechee Nation stands out because we still own more land than everywhere else in the Bible Belt South where black folks are. And one of the major reasons being is because we bought land at the auction in Begidu. So as Sister B said earlier, she mentioned this term, 40 acres and a what now? And a mule. And I often wondered why coming up I would hear people say, I'm still waiting on my 40 acres in a mule. And I was, I am still an animal lover. So I didn't think having a mule was so bad. I just thought they wanted pets at first until I realized, no, the mule is the work beast that you definitely want if in the 1800s you got 40 acres of land. Because otherwise, you're going to have to have human beings plow up this soil by hand, by body, dragging a plow behind you like some others had been forced to do until somebody who was part of the plantocracy could afford to own a mule or a horse and they could saddle up a plow. Oh, that's right. Where did they get the plow? By these African hands. The blacksmiths made those. Because you ain't going to have a plantation until you can plow up land and plant seed. And when they got here from Europe, the indigenous people had this area largely forested. They had certain areas where you grew certain crops. They didn't do what we see now, which is clear cutting. You made enough space just to put a homestead but you didn't need to cut hundreds and hundreds of acres at one time to then feel like, hmm, them same friends that I used to hunt with and fish with, maybe if I put up some buildings, I can create a resort and then I can gate it off from others who aren't my friends that are coming and I want to come onto this land that, oh, their ancestors used to shout on, where their family members are buried right there at that creek where you want to go out and fish where they go to gather their sweet grass to make the baskets, to put the harvest in during harvest season. Now you say, they don't have a right to walk that way? Hmm. Yeah, we had to keep leaning on the Lord's side. To lean, like the song said, lean back, lean back and start to watch this new lay of the land and what was happening and to start to go into the arenas where these other people were, to try to go back in their story, his story, and find out why do they think it's appropriate that everywhere they go, they displace people that look like me? And why 
would you want the very land that you said you didn't want when it was the time of slavery? Because this coast was considered mosquito ridden. It was considered a malaria area. So why now do you want to come and push those who have an immunity of a degree out? Because now to you, it's a commodity, just like we used to be. But when we came off of your roles where you could no longer give us away, where you could no longer sell us, where you could no longer barter us, you said you went bankrupt. One might argue you always were if your spirit could say to you it was okay to think you could own other people and then try to deny their humanity by saying they were three-fifths human beings. So I go back to that and I think, hmm, if a person doesn't know math like that, I don't think I need to be following their foolishness. <laughs> I better do my own work. I better look into this myself. I better start to understand their language, their tradition, their culture, their heritage, the way in which they operate. So I then found myself entering a lot of legal arenas. I found myself doing a lot of research about this land and what really took place. And one of the things that I found was not only that after being in many archives for many years, I'd have to start to wear glasses because they were so low lit to look through these papers and these deeds, but I started finding all these deeds that had the names of the same people that still lived around me and lived up and down the coastline. Same surnames, all oh, Galagichi. I'm seeing land after land after land. I'm doing the math and I'm saying these people ended up with way more than 40 acres. But then I got into Georgia and then I saw that there was a man named Tunis Campbell. I saw that Tunis Campbell brought all these people together in St. Catherine. I saw that Tunis Campbell even was over at Asimov. Ah. They went all together and they got together and they sat down and they laid out a township. And the minute they did that and said that they knew to have a township to keep their land, they would also need an armed force to secure that space. Other folks said, oh, we can't have that. Take it back. Take it back. But whether they paid a dollar for it, they had paid in their blood, their sweat and their tears for it. They had paid by their children having been sold off. They had paid by the very exploitation of their intellectual property for decades, for centuries, from the 1500s into the 16, into the 17, into the 1800s. How do you mean take it back? Take it back for what reason? Because we just can't allow the Negroes to have that level of self-sufficiency and independence. They did everything they could to take it back. And I started to look at the parallels now between what happened in Georgia and what happened on St. Helena Island. And the quick thing I noticed about black land ownership was the difference between having that paper, the deed, versus a land grant. Because if somebody grants you something, they can also take it back. When you have a deed, you've got to argue in court who the rightful owner is and whether this has been properly executed or not. And I said, well, then my family was smart, praying the Lord and hallelujah. They have the deeds. I still have the deeds on both sides from 1862 on my mother's side and my father's side. But then on my father's grandmother's side, they homesteaded the land, didn't think to go to the auction. We can't find their original deed. So destruction heirs came in with alcohol aluminum back in the 1980s. The next thing we know, bulldozers are suddenly going over to Dr. Island. We're wondering what in the world is going on? What are these trucks doing going over there? What are they up to? These people said, we bought the land. Who are you? We work for Alcoa. Alcoa, the aluminum company? Yeah, we work for them. Well, what y'all putting an aluminum factory over here? Where are you putting that? They were like, oh no, they're going to develop it. The next thing we knew, there was a gate, a guard gate, a guard booth. So now you can't just cross in and see what they're doing. 
And where was my grandmother already lying at her rest? And all the family that used to live on the island had married family on St. Helena and married family on Palawana. They never thought there would ever be an issue of going back on to Dante. But no one did a title search and contacted our family. They only contacted the family who had enslaved my family and paid them, bought them out, and then claimed they couldn't find nobody else because all the people in the graveyard over here was a slavery graveyard. Now, from what I recall, though, it was supposed to be 1865 when so-called slavery in America ended. Am I right? So how is it a slavery graveyard if people were buried in there in 1955? But once again, I said, these are the same people who can't do math. So here it is that when it's convenient, they don't know their own language. They don't know their own timelines. They don't know their own history. They can suddenly do things and in court say, I didn't know anything because the legal statutes say the only way they desecrated the area is if they did it willingly and knowingly. So destruction after destruction after destruction there comes into our coast. They clear cut trees. They block people out from sacred lands and where the family compounds were. And they destroy burial areas that sit on the intercoastal waterway and build clubhouses on them. And when the families come forth to try to bury again, they say, you're gated out. You're not. Welcome here. You can't get in. You're not a resident. They're like, I've been a resident. I've born over here originally. I just lived out the road now. But we about to bury my grand. You can't bury a hand. And the family can't even get in. But someone finally does. They find out because the clubhouse is on top of her. And then if you go to court, they say, well, no one fought for it. But how could I fight against something that I couldn't see? Because you gave me out. And then if you get them to court, they say, well, we didn't know it was a graveyard. So when they say that, the judges say, well, case dismissed because they didn't willingly and knowingly do what they did to desecrate the burial area. But did they willingly and knowingly gate out those people of African descent? Did they willingly and knowingly gate out those people of indigenous descent? Did they willingly and knowingly block Gullah Geechee's from their traditional homeland, their traditional fishing areas, their traditional burial areas? They did because they have what you call master plans when they build. Hmm, how interesting the use of that word in modern times. But they tell me, slavery done done. But yet, people are still planning to be people's masters on plantations. Just about every gated area down this coast label themselves such and such plantation. And we protested against these things. We wrote letters against these things. We did all this. It took the murder of Brother George Floyd, God bless him for some of them to get a conscience and say, maybe we should take the word plantation off the front of the gate. And we say, why don't you just take the gate down? What is it that you're hiding that you don't want us to see? And then they go, but it's not your land. You're like, but it wasn't before you got here. So we go into your history. In 1862, there was a second act. There was one in 1861. Both had the same name, the Confiscation Act. Because remember what I said now, our people were considered what? Property. They used the word chattel and slave. Because chattel is property. So at the time that the Civil War began, when all the Anglo people who had been enslaved and my people left and they abandoned the property, it wasn't just the land they abandoned, they abandoned their silverware and their china and their dresses and whatever they didn't take with them, including us. But Abraham Lincoln and the federal troops didn't put us on auction. They put everything else on auction including that land, because they could, because the law said they could confiscate it all. 
for non-payment of taxes. Boy, does that ring a bell. When I started researching and saw this 1861 Confiscation Act, then the 1862 Confiscation Act, first of all, I said, boy, these people are superfluous. Why they got to keep doing the same thing over and over, just lengthening the document, right? But they love doing that in America. But then I said, wait a minute. So they confiscated these things. That's how my ancestors were able to go down and purchase something that they used to be sold or given away alongside of. And now we have it. But by the same token, their children's children's children, those heirs, are losing it by the same means. Non-payment of taxes. This can't all be true. And it isn't. Because in some cases, it's not that they just didn't pay. Like we say, and just drive on so. It is because if this sister here owned this property, and she owned 10 acres, but she had been paying $100 for the past 20 years, that's what her taxes were. Here you come, next door now. You build this multi-million dollar gated area next to her. But now, she didn't change the doorknob on her house. She didn't change the screen door. She didn't even get a new set tee for putting in the living room. Her taxes end up going up to $1,000 in one year. Because you live next to her now. And the assessor says that by virtue of the fact that this particular parcel of land, he only bought that land for $100,000. But he has now improved it to the point that it is appraised at a few million. Let's say 10 million. All right? I know you like that. Let's say 10 million. 10 million dollars, his property is appraised at. Prior to him coming, her property was only appraised as $10,000. Now her property value is $100,000 because she got her little house there. His is $10 million because of all the amenities that they say he's put into his land. So now, the county claim they're being equitable by fair assessment. Based on not what she can afford, not what she has done or not done, but because the property next to her, once you start selling off property that is adjacent, whatever that going rate is, is now what they think she can get. But she ain't going nowhere. Her property is not for sale. There is no for sale sign on her property. She has never once listed her property with anyone. But she had $100 ready to pay the tax bill. What's she going to do now when the bill is 1000 So here he come. You know, I could help you out. You know, if you need a little help with your tax bill, I could help you out. Now, if she did what my mama said, take petty shop and don't take that help and get to frying some fish and some chicken and all that kind of stuff and get her thousand dollars off herself, if she gonna take his so-called help, he ain't come with a paper. You know all you got to do sign right there. You know, ain't no problem. You know, it's just something that my lawyer said, you know, that I should let you sign. You know, you know when you get to 900, you know, you can give me that back. Actually, that paper says you can live here until you die, but when you die, this property will go over to him. She looked at it. She read the part she understood, but she's not an attorney. And the rest of it is in real estate law language. She didn't know all the three, four, five pages was up under there because what did he do? Turn it to the last page where the signature line was. And she was so desperate because she was afraid if I don't pay this tax, I'm going to lose my land. If I don't pay this tax, I won't have anywhere to live. If I don't pay this tax, what am I going to do? Because I didn't mention to you, she already 85 years old. She was born and raised there. She ain't getting up going to work on no job. She can't use no computer. She don't have no cell phone. She can't do none of that. So when he keep coming by the house, he seemed like he a nice man. The man just living back there. The man said, building a nice house back behind me. He came and introduced himself when he first got here, and he kept coming by, 
kept introducing herself, kept bringing her little lunch, kept doing a little something else until she thought he was trustworthy. So she ended up losing her land because he decided she was living too long. She didn't live to be 90. She, he planned to expand that property. He wanted to put workforce housing on that property she got. So he takes her to court now and tries to sue her for her property, all based on that paper. He can't get it. He end up in county council. They find an eminent domain claim for why they need that property because guess what? There's a lot of traffic coming since he built all them houses in that resort back there. We need to widen the road. And guess what they need to widen it through? Her property. Don't touch it! But her property. So when we think about Gullah Geechee land ownership, we think about black land ownership in the Bible Belt, people simplify it. And they just say, oh, people just gonna take our stuff. Nobody take nothing from you when you fight for it. If they beat you for it, that's different than taking it from you. All right? I would prefer you tell me they beat you for it because that's how hard you fought before you let go. As opposed to they took it from me like you just stood there and you just let them pick it up and leave. Land don't go nowhere. But you will if you don't know your land rights. And you don't realize you have human rights and water rights like anybody else does. So when the Gullah Geechee Nation came into existence in 2000 as an international nation of the world, we stood on our human right to self-determination. And we did that because we knew we needed to have a stopgap against land laws in the Gullah Geechee Nation. As you heard me say up there on the film, the land that we family, the waterway that we bloodline, that land has our blood, our sweat, and our tears in it. It has the placenta of many of us in it. And it's not as simple as people make it sound that, oh, the younger generation just don't want to do nothing. They don't care about their land. That's why they let their grandmama house go. No, there's a lot of different tricks of the trade that have been used to exploit the lack of knowledge of law that many of our people have. So they don't realize when a destruction man sends them a letter and say, well, your land, brother, ain't worth nothing. So really, you should take this $5,000 from me because you ain't going to be able to do nothing with it anyway. I always say to my people, think about it. If a man come and tell you that the land of milk and honey is somewhere out there, he came to your land and tell you the land of milk and honey is out there, and he not running ahead of you to go to the land of milk and honey, you need to stay right where you at and wonder what's up with this man. Because if you take what he give you and you go running for that land of milk and honey out there, guess what he going to do? He going to sit there on your land. He going to go in there and eat all the honey drink all the milk and chant the law. And when you come back, you can't get back in the house. And unfortunately, that is where Gullah Geechee's now are, where some have been locked out of their own homeland. And now they want to learn how to get their land back. And I said, the first thing you need to do is learn how to hold on to the land your family has. I don't care if it's a half an acre. Hold on to it. Learn your rights about that land. Learn the history of how it was obtained, who obtained it, and every year have a pool of money ready to pay that tax. If we can raise money to buy sneakers, we can raise money to pay land tax. If we can drive cars with rims on them, and we can get it all, come on, y'all know I'm telling the truth. If we can drive cars with rims on them, we can pay land tax. We can also purchase more land if we stop purchasing cars because land is an appreciating asset. I don't care what they tell you. You will always be able to do something with land. That's why people want to push you off it. You can feed yourself from it if that land is healed. 
If you want the water, you sure enough can feed yourself with the land and the water with. It don't take a whole lot to learn how to do that as long as we also do things that are healthy to the land and for the land and on the land so that we can sustain the coastline and we can sustain the water quality. And by virtue of sustaining water quality, we will sustain not only fisheries health but human health and we can produce a stronger generation instead of a weaker one that realizes where the value is. is when you can have a place and a space that you call your own, where you and your family can gather together and continue the traditions, and someone older can teach you, but to learn, you must be teachable. If you know everything, you think Google is God, you can forget it. Because Google is not God, and that comes from me, who is a computer scientist that graduated with honors. We program you through this. This is a personal digital assistant. We not taught you to call it a cell phone. It ain't a phone. It's a computer. But what I need to program you to do is use it to research your rights, to know your rights, to have study groups teaching family members at the family reunion what our family legacy is on the land. The first thing that happens if you go to an heir's property lawyer and say, my cousins are now, that's another issue, fighting me over land. They're going to ask you to create a family tree. Why? Because that family tree is going to determine in court who owns the most interest in the property and whether you have an interest in it or not. Because if they find out you were one of them children they raised, You've adopted, but there ain't no real adoption papers. You won't have any rights at all. It'll only be those heirs. Remember when I said that 1862 deed and all the way through all the lands and at the end said, and their heirs. So the thing that I want you to be is an heir apparent that appears to have some sense, some common sense that you put with some dollars and cents to not only hold on to land, but to also be in a position to create an estate plan that then passes down that land through a family LLC, a limited liability corporation, where that family sets rules and bylaws and regulations that says if somebody dies without a will, it doesn't just become heirs property all over again, but it actually transfers into that trust that is for the family, that is that family LLC. Because then everybody in that family, the heirs to come, will have their interest in it. They will have shares in it. And you need clauses that say it should never be sold out of your family. Now you can always buy more collective family property together and enter it into that LLC. But that nobody is ever to sell any property out of that LLC. So see, they only gave me a few minutes tonight. So I had to touch on some highlights. I can't break it all down to. And I don't have a license to practice law in the state of Georgia, so do not take any of what I say as legal advice. <laughs> but it is at least a lens into how Gullah Geechis came to own land, how some of us still retain the ownership of land because we work collectively with our family. We still live on family compounds together like the song said, work together till a do not you get weary, agree it can't be in the promised land. Those are promised lands, those are oasis. Some of you will say, well, we ain't had no 10 and 40 acres like y'all we quit, but we sure got a half an acre with a house on them. Well, fix that house up before they start telling you that they're going to tear your house down because it does not fit the current code because you ain't maintaining the house. That's another strategy. You heard that word gentrification. As much as things change, they remain the same. It's the southern gentry who are part of the plantation aristocracy, the plantocracy, you see? So the words are not there for not. So when we're in urban centers like Savannah, you hear a lot gentrification. Jacksonville gentrification, Charleston gentrification, right? When you are on islands and rural areas, you hear displacement. Because there is a difference, really, between the terminology. If you own your own property and someone puts you off of it, that's displacement. 
gentrification a lot of times applies to people who are renting. And somebody who owned it decided, I want to flip it. Or I can get more rent from the new people coming from the new Yankees. They like the Yankees now coming south because they're bringing Yankee money, they feel like. That the Southerners don't have them. So they up the rent. Now you can't live there and then they redo the whole building and you used to pay $500 a month and they charge somebody else $5,000 a month for the same place that you lived in for the past 40 years. So the terminologies match in terms of removal of our people from this coast in many ways. But know that they are cousins. They're not the same person. But in either way, I ain't trying to go to their family reunion. I am trying to have my family still be united on this coast. Because as you see on our national flag, we be Gullah Geechee anointed people. You see in the center, there's a what? What is that in the middle? A tree. Do you notice anything about that tree that's different than most trees? It's people. It's human bodies that are intertwined. It is an African family tree. It is rooted in this land that is the Gullah Geechee Nation. The blue that is surrounding it is the water because the water to bring me the water to take me back. That gold is from that Carolina gold rice that we grew here that made others rich and that we now also were the ones that they call gold because they call us black gold because we made them rich. But where was that black gold treasure placed in that green, the land? That gold is there over that land because that sun in the brighter day is still on its way for us. That who, who was last shall be first. The stone that the builders rejected <laughs> is now the ones they're building on, that they're banking on as we are not now just faced with destruction mix on our coast. We're faced with an Anthropocene crisis that humans cause, that you saw in that video. Sea level rise, climate change, taking out the same real estate that should have never been built in the places where it is, for the most part, because the natives said, don't build it. So in many ways, the world now needs us. They do treasure us now. I spent last week in Washington, D.C., launching this month, which is National Oceans Month, or International Oceans Month, but they celebrate Capitol Hill's Ocean Week. And why was I there? Because now people want to learn about the Gullah Geechee legacy on this land. And they want to know how to retain it, how to sustain it, how do we need to adapt. And I said the greatest thing you could ever do is go back to old landmark. Here we, we land, let we still have we farm and take on them, restore all. All oh, the salt marsh and thing. One million acres of it we are going to restore in the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida through something called the Southeast Salt Atlantic Salt Marsh Initiative. SASME, March Forward. We're doing work for resiliency. But I say, you know, the thing about it, talking to y'all in Capitol Hill, I go right back to realizing y'all have this convoluted language that we don't need words for in God. Because the word adaptation, the word sustainability, the word resilience, none of the words exist in God. And I realize why. Because we are the embodiment of all of them. And the sooner people realize that's the reason our ancestors were brought here, is to show others how to live on this land, the sooner we can teach our children to do what our ancestors did, the sooner this will be restored. And that brighter day that you see glowing there and here will come. And I pray that I'll be there shouting on the shoreline with the Gullah Geechees that can come to me and say, Queen Quick, we get you. And we don't want to come in there. And we got some more to it. And I'll say, Take it. Because that churn, that heaven for no, that my living and my one, it did be. And that other word I learned. Ally, allyship, doesn't mean sit back 
and let us lose out. It means that if you realize that we too have rights, you stand with us. You speak out on our behalf to your audiences of people. You let them sit on your piazza and have a little sweet tea with you, darling, and you tell them about the legacy of the color each. You see and how we've helped you survive and thrive on this coast many times. Because believe you me, you see that? The circle, we're all interconnected and inextricably tied to this land. And anything you put out in the circle eventually does what? Comes back. So I pray that what you put out here in the circle going forward is positivity, upliftment, healing and blessings. And I pray that God blesses the land of the Gullah Geechee Nation and that we continue to stand anointed as God make we. Oh, they're going to chill out. You talk for the Juneteenth. You talk for the Jubilee. Oh, because we were self control. Because there's no order we be free. Oh, 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 Each one, teach one. Peace and blessings, y'all.